Welcome to another podcast. Thanks for being here. And I'm excited to welcome back to the show, Austin Yoakum. He is the owner of Yoakum Strength and is a creative mind who is constantly challenging mundane practices in athletic development. Austin has been a multi-time guest and I always love our conversations. The balance point of so much of modern sport training and sport performance is shifted heavily towards uh, more of a prescriptive mechanism, perfect technique, fundamentals, drills, and along with that, an acceleration, an emphasis on winning as early as possible. If we look at so many elite athletes, especially elite natural athletes of the past, they developed outside of that system. They had a chance to flourish based off free play, natural learning, and a balanced process of development. On today's show, Austin will give his take on the foundations of this athlete-centered development process, the one that prioritizes play as a foundation of movement training, the athlete natural learning process, and a long-term development that thrives on both competition and creativity and exploration of movement patterns and problem solving. This was an awesome show. Austin's ideas are always motivating to me in my own process, and I know they will be for you as well. With today's show, I also wanted to let you know, Austin and I will be co-presenting in a one-day live seminar June 8th in Cincinnati, Ohio, and for the details, you can head to justflysports.com. The early bird registration for that expires on May 1st. That being said, let's get to the show here with Austin Yoakum. Austin, I know you've been spending some time rock climbing, bouldering, probably parkour as well. Uh, Curious just how those things have been going for you and some of the things they've taught you in your own performance training journey. Yeah, you know, starting off with the rock climbing. I, man, I've been geeking out over uh, trying to get out of the weight room and doing stuff. And you and I have talked about that on, on multiple podcasts. But rock climbing was really the biggest, one of the biggest eye openers. It's like, you can do all this row volume. You can do all the like hamstring one and hip mobility one is a big one that rock climbing really, really exposes. And you get on the wall and it's like, oh my God, that was so fake. Like my row strength and my hip mobility that I gained doing my two minutes of couch stretching a week. So fake, man. It was just not applying to the wall. And I was getting to the wall the very first time I was getting there. I was like, bro, I have no ability. Like my fingers are a massive, like low hanging fruit. I can't generate the force that I have in my lats and uh, in the core when you're pulling something through my fingers. I'm like, if I can develop that, what does that low hanging fruit like do for for the rest of my performance and it was really just in a big eye opener of going from I, I talk about this all the time going from a lot of athletes try to go from good to great in things like we go from good to great in a squat good to great in a deadlift and it takes a lot of time to do that to go from good to great and you get pretty little return because like if you're already good enough at it it's not your sport the only thing you really need to go good to great from is your number one sport your number one priority and no athlete is a squat like that. That's not their, that's not their sport. That's not the thing they need to go good to great from, but we run our heads through the wall to get there. Cause it's the only way we know how to make progress. So I got on the wall. I was like, Oh my God, I can go from absolute shit to suck from this and get a massive gain from that. So jumping on the wall, that was just, it was the physical benefits of like getting better hip mobility because you're doing hour long stretches in quotations when you're on the wall, like you're finding so many different positions. And I've done posts on that, just showing the, the hip, mobility that you get done there and the the gains in the fingers and the gains in the pulling strength is all amazing but it's really the the psychological kind of shift in the outward view of training and looking at it of like oh my goodness the low-hanging fruit is kind of everywhere if we just get out of the weight room and how much that can help us with low amounts of effort jumping on a wall once a week twice a week to have massive improvements to our overarching goal of whatever your sport is yeah rock climbing that what you said, it reminds me of a long time ago, Rafe Kelly talked about on this podcast, training at the highest possible level of complexity. And I think that level may shift depending on you know where you are or the setting. But with like pull-ups or, or grip strength, like you said, I could do a pull-up program and I could do a grip strength program or I could just rock climb and my grip and my pull-ups will be better, you know, at however long it's a four, six, eight week training phase, my pull up and grip strength, I guarantee will be better if I did rock climbing, which is, and and like, cause this winter actually, yeah, for me, I I made my winter activity three months of rock climbing. And, but I, as I go through that, I think I realize it is the complexity. Yes. But there's also like these little nuances behind the complexity. There's like variability. It's not the same complexity every single time it's always it's very task and problem oriented 
and it's activating different parts of your brains or your your brains, your brain <laughs> that I, I think can it like like when you're on a like a not even just bouldering, but like a top rope and it's challenging. And, and whether you have, you know, a self pulley or someone holding the rope, you really don't want to fall. Like there's something in your system that's like, I need to stay on the wall. And so I, I find my body driving extra juice to the muscles. The lactate pump goes, if you measured my lactate, it would be so much higher climbing than honestly anything I could even do just hanging, like just hanging from a bar. I, I couldn't get anywhere near, I, and I like the term comprehensive pump too, that you get from being on the wall. And so it's like this variability plus complexity, you know, plus like other emotions that come up that I, I it's just the total piece of it. I, it, I think because I think we always also look for maybe like, well, what's the one thing that you get from this complex training thing? Well, there's a few things, you know, and you just have to do it. It's like you just have to experience it, too, to really feel that. And uh, yeah, the ideas it generates, too, I think, are for other aspects of training, I think, are really phenomenal as well. Well, Will Rattel just posted about this yesterday, but he was talking about how Ecent, like everybody has this like one reason you should do eccentric training. And I was like laughing at that because it's like, it's so true. It's like, and he's like, you do eccentric training because it's just, it makes it harder, right? And <laughs> once you reach a certain level of athletic ability, again, trying to max out a singular output, a singular thing that that's what we're all looking for, that five pound gain on the squat, it's impossible to just run your head. I mean, you can do it, but it's going to take so much effort. So how can you make things harder to get a stimulus to the body at a very, very low cost. And that is the complexity model that you were talking about. It's like hop on the wall instead of just doing more pull-ups with more weight. And, and you're going to have to continually add so much more stress to get the same level of stimulus that you could just do climbing a wall because there is so much going on there. And I like that aspect of training, the, the make it harder, like find ways to make it harder in a sense of find ways to make it more complex through that com complexity aspect. And when you were saying the, the 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 like the emotional connection too it's like this is one thing that i think strength conditioning has and we're going to talk about this at the conference this is one of my passions right now it's like we have destroyed movement practices we have de destroyed the love for movement we can't like we can't enjoy that as a strength coach it's such a weird thought process how much we really like thrive on and destroying movement practices we can't just do things because they are fun we can't just do things because they're enjoyable because when they are enjoyable, when they are fun, when we don't have a specific singular metric there, it's really hard for us to feel important as a coach. It's really hard for us to see the stimulus that is happening there as a coach. And we, I think a lot of coaches are very tunnel vision. They are very in their Excel sheet. They are very looking at the singular thing happening in front of them. And they don't look at the long-term adaptation you can have an athlete have. And that's it's and I, again I catch myself doing this too. Whenever I bring out numbers, flying ten numbers, jump at numbers, mm -hmm. I get so lost in it. Right, like how can we drive that number up right away? And for me, it really should be how can we drive that number up through four years of training? And I think a lot of times coaches really lose out on that one step back, one step removed of what does this look like? What does this stimulus look like through four years of training? Because I promise you, you have an athlete do pull-ups for four years versus climb for four years, that athlete that climbs for four years is going to give you so much more mm -hmm. out of them throughout yeah. that four-year span. You can NOS them. You, you can absolutely NOS them with pull-ups, with deadlifts, with bench press, with squats for t a 12-week program. And you can get decent results. And that's what a lot of the private training sector is too. That's why so many of those coaches are lost in that sauce because they only have athletes for 12 weeks. And for me, I just, I just reject that notion of things. I look at the four-year, the 40-year kind of process of, how can we make this movement practice enjoyable for the athlete themselves? So by the end of the four years, not the end of the four weeks, they are a completely different athlete. They, they, they view movement, they view their bodies completely different, and they enjoy what we're doing. And those two things need to be together because you're not going to get that stimulus. You're not going to get that adaptation without them massively obsessed over what you're doing. Yeah, what you're saying, um, actually, I had to look up this email here. Because it was, I just read this a few days ago and it, talking about that patient process. Um, I know a lot of coaches, Hank Kreienhoff and others, uh, Jeff Moyer talk about this, like we suffer from acceleritis. Like it's like, we want to be really good at one thing right away. Um, I, I do think it's easy to have, yeah, like an athlete in a high powered, like, and I just wrote an email actually about this, talking about training like a tree. 
the roots are all the athletic movement qualities you learn when you're young, the free play, the exploration, the love for doing what you do too. That's a really important root, maybe the most important. Obviously, genetics helps with all these things too, but it's like your library that you learn early on. And then the trunk is, now let's intensify some of those qualities. Um, and I think that's where, you know, the strength and the regiment, you know, okay, here's some prescriptions for, and, and it is a prescription, right? That's different than play <laughs> to fill gaps. Okay. You need to, Hey, you could add 10 more pounds of muscle, your frame, a little more compression, a little more armor for your sport, those types of things. But then the re-expansion is, and this is probably not related, but then the branches is the re-expansion. It's the re-expansion of creativity and creative processes. It's like Steph Curry, who's amazing and won all these championships, still having fun in warmups doing trick shots and how many threes can I make? And even like playing golf and like they'll throw him a ball always on the golf course, he'll shoot a 50 foot, you know, like those kind of like just cre- the way that even an elite athlete can make a play, it's this creative re-expansion. But what you were saying, I, I think this fits so well. There's an email I get every Monday uh, from uh, Billy Oppenheimer as a writer. And he had a, his recent email had a few different topics. I actually have it here in front of me, but one was it's just so good. And I love the example of trees and nature and studying nature. And he talks about, this was a direct quote from the email. It says, well, trees require sunlight to grow. The strongest and longest living trees don't get much sunlight in their early years. Instead, they spend their first few decades waiting patiently in their mother's shade. Uh, that was from the book, The Secret Wisdom of Nature. And it actually says limited sunlight leads to slow growth. Slow growth leads to the development of dense, long-lasting wood. And says, youngsters without any shade grow fast and therefore develop wood that is airy and susceptible to fungi, yeast, mold, and mildews. And so, you know, I, I mean, on one end, okay, yes, like there is a need for early exposure of, of certain things, I think, in sport on a level. You know, I mean, you hear stories of t- like Tiger Woods, but then I guess he said later he did not recommend the way he was brought up in sport, you know. And um, I was just actually having a conversation with Jeremy Frisch about this. I don't mean to make this all about like youth sports and development, but I do think it's important to see the whole picture is my son is five and he wanted to do baseball. A friend of his was doing it and I'm at practice and I'm just like, this is the worst thing ever. Like they're just sitting there teaching five-year-olds, air quotes, the fundamentals while they just like, they climb fences and are bored and kicking around. And I'm like, this could be so much more dense and rich. And I was talking with Jeremy Frisch and he's like, yeah, it's basically for that reason. He didn't put his kids in baseball till seven or nine and they're playing at a a good level now, you know, but it kind of makes me think about maybe even with baseball, it's like the desire to get somebody in something before they're ready what's this going to give you? Not much. You're just told not to kick around the dirt. But um, all that just being said, I just don't think we look at it um, in that long term like a tree because it's like if you overemphasize on the trunk, how good can I make this trunk? You know, how fast can I get this trunk to be, you know, huge and solid or whatever markers. But at the same time, this is disconnected from the, the roots and the branches and the creative potential and the movement potential. And and maybe in some ways that's almost existential in the sense of we also live in kind of a world where everyone's got their own thing. You know, you're the sport coach, you're the strength coach, you're the nutrition coach, you're the speed coach. And we all obviously want to do the best we can in where we are with the, the structure of sport collectively. But I also think that, yeah, when, when it's like a, just a track coach who does all the strength, I think sometimes things change, you know, like maybe there's, you could have more planning. Anyways, I'm, I kind of going going off on the you know the long term thing, but that just kind of got me thinking about some of these things I've been considering recently. And I do think, like you said, like like rock climbing and those things, and the adaptation, the long slow adaptations of of something like that versus oh you're 11 and just get on the fingerboard, man, and like max out the you know like it's just it, it's it's a slow growth with all parts of the tree and not just an over focus on one. Well, and that that that, that touches on. Part of it is like I reject the notion of being like a coach, you know, like I reject that notion. It's like I, I, I provide movement practices, movements like environments. And once you can take that step back, then you don't have the ego attached. And as soon as I reattach that ego again, I become that coach. I become the speed coach. I become the football coach. Your worth is put into that. And that, that that's the most frustrating thing about the field to me. It's like we, we are just unwilling to admit that is the true reason we are doing those things. And and we are unwilling to just look at basic levels of psychology of where like we as a person need to feel seen. We need to feel heard. We need to feel like Mm -hmm. important. We need those things. And that's not that's not a bad thing to need. But coaches reject that. 
It's like, I'm doing it for the athlete. I'm doing it for this. Like, this is why. No, it's not. That's not how psychology works. Like, that's that's not the reason you're actually doing those things. And when you can't admit that that factor, you take it, you end up taking it out on the athlete. Like 100%, mm-hmm. you force the athletes to do things that they have no desire to do, no reason to do strictly. So at the end of the day, you can say, I'm the speed coach and I got my athlete faster. Look how we're all doing great. It's like, was well, that what the athlete was missing? Is that what the athlete wanted? Like, what, what was the actual issue there? Why was the reason you're getting them faster? And I really loved your component there of play versus prescription. And what, like, it, you, coaches will look at that and be like, well, it's the youth train. It's not youth training. It, it's just movement practice. With all of your athletes, it needs to be play needs to drive the prescription. And we get lost in that. We just prescribe. Yeah. It, we're the same as like the medical field where we're just prescribing. We see something we prescribe, prescribe, prescribe. Mm-hmm. Yes. Strength conditioning is the very, very similar. It's like we're just prescribing speed. We're just prescribing strength. We're just prescribing hypertrophy, whatever it is. We're just throwing that out there. Use the play to drive the prescription. What do they need? What are we finding out when they are playing? What do we see? Then you go prescribe. Then you come back to the play. And like you said, you have that root, the trunk, the tree, and it's all synergistic. And and right now, I really feel like we're the same as a lot of other fields. We're just handing things out. And it's funny because strength coaches, all strength coaches are like these hardo guys, like where they're anti that, like, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. They're just handing out like things like they're handing out supplements or handing their Mm -hmm. quick way. But then we do the same thing in our field. Like we hand out strength, we hand out speed. I I just, I don't agree with that thought process. And I think looking, I think a lot of coaches just wrap it up as, well, that's just youth training like as a way to like reject that notion. I'm like, I, I really believe that's a lot of coaches egos getting in the way of what their athletes actually need and what their athletes want too. Because that that's a big component of it too. Does that athlete want to be great? Does that athlete like yes or no? Like, do you know that answer? And if the answer is no, then admit that answer and go talk to that athlete about what they want to do. And you'll find a lo- out a lot about that through the play aspect. But I think a yeah. lot of coaches want to be great. And the way for them to be great is for their athletes to be great. And for me in the like the mushroom world that I live in, it's just it just seems very disconnected from actual reality and actual what does that person want? Yeah, I think so much of things is is integration and connections. And even in the you know, the container of sports performance, strength and conditioning, I find the, the coaches who inspire me the most are uh, like Kurt Hester comes to mind in the last podcast or the podcast we did. He just talks about how he prioritizes so heavily relationships with the athlete, connecting with the athlete. Like he has a questionnaire to understand the athlete's background, their life. And uh, to me, I mean, that, like, that is, I think, a really, like, yeah, an athlete centered mentality. And obviously, he has great training too. But I, I think that as a, a first step is really important. Um, I had another thought <laughs> based on something you had said. I don't know why it kind of escaped me a little bit. Um, but oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, play is the foundation. I do, I do agree with that. I think that's something we, it, it's almost like, um, like right, a healthy society is a wellness, found, the foundation is wellness. And I think it's very similar to the foundation of a good sport is play and joy. And that sets up, okay, maybe we'll have, a, we have prescriptions here, but it is on the, because I, I do think it's okay to have a prescriptive strength program. I don't think there's anything wrong with, I think three by 10 is great, you know, <laughs> like, but it's, it's, well, what is the foundation? And where are we going with this ultimately? What are the roots? What are the branches that we need for this tree to grow in the ideal manner? And I think as you alluded to, too, what motivates and inspires the athlete? What's the tree the athlete ultimately wants, you know? And um, yeah, I think that all that integration all works together to look at the the pictures. And uh, I I guess the microcosm is the single training session as well. You know, there's there's a foundation of play. There is a prescriptive element. And there's also exploration and autonomy given I, I, some great coaches that I've had on this podcast talk about uh, Jamie Smith really comes to mind a view of strength. He really values autonomy, especially in his older athletes. And I think of that as a re-expansion, that formula. Well, and that, that you talk about the training session, like coming back to the training session, the biggest thing that I've switched up in the past, like two years, it's like, we are training for the sake of training for this moment mm. right here, for this squat set right here, for this jump right here. And once you get athletes to switch over to that mindset, the results you get from it is insane because no longer is the squat for the sport, the the, the jump for something. It's like 
we're, we're just very disconnected in a lot of our movement practices. Everything is for something else. Trying to get an athlete to do something for the sake of doing it mm-hmm. and then finding enjoyment from that and then watching the stimulus they get out of that and watching how much they like skip, they skip less. Cause that's the big thing. It's like when you start doing things for something else, it's like, okay, well, um, I have a baseball game this weekend, so I'm going to skip training session here. And then I have uh, this, this day, so I'm going to skip this, or I'm going to go light on that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And like, it just turns into like, there's, there's no more training because the training never really was the purpose. It's just like random things that you're throwing out because you're always doing it for something else. So I really, I really love tying that in and really getting the athletes to accept the fact that we are training for the singular fact of training. And this training session is what matters. We are not looking at this global, like kind of make believe world that we're talking about. And it's like this metaphorical truth that once you see training in this light, you get so much more done like that. That's the that's the fact. It's it's the joy, the relationships, all these things. But like meathead strength coaches will write that off. They're like, OK, yeah, but we have to train. Bro, I promise you, I promise you, you come to our gym, we are training and we are training harder than 99% of athletes. And it's way more consistent because of that, because of the joy, right? So the joy and the enjoyment and the relationships drive the meathead part of it, not having the meathead part. Because as soon as you let it for something else, it turns into that burnout because there's really no purpose. Like, why am I doing this squat? What is happening? So either they start to skip for other things or they just get super burnt out with it. So I really think it's important to talk about like, not coming off as a movement yogi because i think a lot of coaches can see like they talk about there's so many stupid coaches they say oh it's it's fetch you're just playing spike ball all day like it's just a waste of time like i'd be like bro you don't know like you don't know the stimulus we're getting 200 jumps done 200 jumps done that day like a ridiculous amount of squats we're pring like all these crazy things so i think it's important to mention the the meathead part of it like these these pieces are the foundation to getting stimulus done to getting really really good results um because now they are actually joining the training session because they do training for the sake of training, not for some overarching kind of make believe goal that really nobody has pinpointed out what it is. And a lot of times it just turns into what is the goal of coach, not what is the goal of the athlete? Yeah. Training for the sake of training. I, I've been thinking a lot more. I had um, Richard Shavis on the podcast not too long ago, and I've actually been re-listening to some of his work. He does uh, work with Dr. Ed Kadje. I believe is a psychiatrist, but also has a training background. And, you know, they talk and, and, and they're not the first people. I mean, you have like Wilhelm Reich and like bioenergetics and the embodiment of human experiences. But something that even like um, Ed Cadia had said was the effect of lactate on the brain. And it's a very positive effect. And it's like, well, why do people go to CrossFit gyms? And why do they do hit every single day? You think they do like you know, maybe twice a week and do something aerobic a few days or do some heavy strength. And maybe they do, but like so much of it is hit. And there, it's a lactate drug, you know, and there's a heavy lifting drug too. There's all these kind of embodied experiences within the scope of training itself you get and it makes you feel a certain way. And I, I've said this in the past. I think sometimes, you know, sometimes we think that... um I, that we that maybe the strength we're doing, you know, well, did it move the needle for the athlete? I, I hope so. Where's the transfer point? And then, but on the other hand, you may have changed an athlete's life because they found a form of training they genuinely enjoyed, and that would stick with them for life. Like they are like, I really like training like this, and maybe it is. Maybe there, hopefully, there's some transfer pieces, and the balance is done as well as possible. But at the same time, as well, it's like, well, how do you fall in love with training? How do we find? training that you really enjoy and you enjoy the experience, be it, you know, a heavy weights or if there's a lactate piece, learning your body better, doing athletic things uh, just in the gym, basic like gymnastics or calisthenics, playing games, roughhousing. How can I help you to understand this full spectrum of the process and all the embodied emotions that come with that and the joy that comes with that? And yes, we, we do hope that the, the prescriptive pieces are the pieces you need to take a step forward in your sport. But at the same time, there's also the fullness of this experience. And I think, I mean, that's why ultimately you want people to go to a gym in general, even outside of sports performance, just training. You want them to have an embodied experience that helps them to live a more joyful life. Yeah, a joyful life, confident life. That, that, that's one of the biggest things, giving them a space to trust their bodies in. And once like that, that is the number one stimulus. Like when I can get an athlete to trust their body, to, like own it and really like my body is capable my body is able 
bro, then as a coach, man, they're going to practice like that. They're going, stepping up to the plate like that. And the best I ever perform is when, not when I'm the strongest, not when I'm the, fa- it's mm-hmm. when I feel the most capable, when I feel the mm-hmm. most confident in my body. And that comes through a movement practice that they are doing because they enjoy. They are, they are showing up and, and they have confidence in the movement practice. That is why people believe so heavily in things like knees over toes and even like stuff like Seedman. It has nothing to do with the actual physiological stuff. Mm-hmm. It's the psychological yeah. Oh my God, I didn't know I could push my knees over my toes because I was told not to. I was told I had bad knees. Now I can push my knees over toes and I'm like, oh my God, I'm a, I'm a mm-hmm. freak. I can do this. And if you get an athlete to think they're a freak, it is crazy how fast yeah. they actually become freaks. It's the same thing we've talked about, like getting an athlete to think they are a scorer of the ball. Yeah. Once they trigger, once they get that and all they need, they, they don't need a ton of ideas. Like we talked about this before the podcast, ideas are viruses, man. Once you can get an idea like that planted into the seed of an athlete's head, they spread and they create stories. We are master story creators. That that's why our species survives. Like we're so good at creating stories and telling people these stories and believing in these stories. And you get an athlete to water that seed and you plant that seed in an athlete's head and they believe it, man. And once they believe it, it's over. It's why something like Scientology is so powerful for a lot of athletes because it's like I am the embodiment of this. I am this thing. You see, you see some really successful people in Scientology because it puts blinders on and they, they they have this idea in their head that they are it. And Nietzsche talks about it too. It's like the the you don't think about becoming it. You don't work on the process of becoming it. You just decide you are it. And he says that, like you decide you are it. I am the person. And getting an athlete to that point of I am the scorer, I am the starter, I am the star man from there it's it's nuts to see the confidence in an athlete and from the, the physiological side from there man is super easy and it's not like you throw out the physiology it's not like we're not getting stronger or bigger or faster or stronger like through these it's not like you throw all that away to like go have a psych evaluation with these athletes it's all interconnected but i think starting with becoming it and then creating it is a much better pathway than just focusing on bigger faster stronger Today's podcast is sponsored by the Plyomat. The Plyomat is not only an incredible vertical jump and reactive strength index uh, testing device, but it also is an incredible training device. The Plyomat not only allows single response jumps, but also the chaining of multiple mats together. So you can use it for bounding multiple series of hurdle hops. You can get not only height, but reactive strength for a multi-jump situation. It's an incredible, again, testing and training tool, and you can learn more at Plyomat. Net. Yeah, one thing you said, I, I was just thinking about this is you know, along with the emotional pieces, like the emotional pieces you get from more of the prescriptive gym work, but some of the emotional pieces that come out of play and games. And I, I, a question I did want to ask, I think I had it a little bit later on, but like basically ideas on um, like general play versus like I just did a podcast re- recently with Scott Leach talking about that, like handball is fun, you know. But like, all right, well, if I want specific tasks, like here's a specific prep, you know, agility game that replicates some um, on-field situations that has more specificity than just playing handball. Uh, But what you were saying with the emotional piece, though, because this is so interesting to me is I was just watching, um, this is actually the first, one of the first seasons I'm not coaching youth soccer because I'm coaching track this year or this spring. I'm watching my son's soccer practice. And they were just doing like a scrimmage four on four. And with, I'll tell you, with kids soccer, scoring a goal, like you just said, scoring, it gives them such confidence. Like there's, that is such a rush for them. Like my son scored a goal and just this like look on his, you could just tell he changed. As soon as that ball goes in the goal, the person who scored, there's, there's a different, like, there's just something that comes over them that, like you said, it's confidence. It's like, like you said, I can score. I'm not just like the defensive player, right? Like I think there's, and of course the world needs defensive players for sure. But at the same time, there is, yeah, that mentality that can be developed in the non-specific, the mental and emotional piece. Um, can I t- can I tell a story on that oh, part? Yeah, certainly. Because I have a very so in fourth grade we had an under the lights football game, and me and the my buddy Luke we scored a touchdown in that game, and it was the only touchdown scored in that game, and we were the only two to end up playing college football. And at that time, and never once were we the most athletic, never once were we the highest, but 
in fourth grade, we scored a touchdown. He passed mm-hmm. it to me. I caught the ball. We scored in fourth grade. It was terrible football, whatever. But we scored and we talked about it from fourth grade until we graduated about that moment of scoring that mm-hmm. touchdown and having that belief. And it was the first time both of us were like, oh, my God, we can do this. Like, yeah. we can do this. And once you like from fourth grade, I was infected with I'm a football player. I can score touchdowns. I'm really good at for like an ignorant belief. It was, again, mm-hmm. terrible football. There's no reason for me to actually believe. But I had a data point there of like we can play football. And we're the only two out of that school. Like there was dude, there was a dude that broke the Minnesota state record in the 100 yard dash, never played football, like all these things. But like that, that singular moment in fourth grade where it was like, we can do this. And we planted that seed and then went off from that moment because we always had something different. Like there, there was always just that data point that was different. And I think providing you, you talked about the difference between general and specific. It's like providing those opportunities first, providing the general, sol- like you are a general solver of movement problems and you are capable of doing that. Get, that's the general aspect of play. That's why we play handball. That's why I set up situations where athletes aren't super used to that. From there, then we get specific and we, we can definitely do specific things. But until you get that to switch on in their heads, it, it, it's per- you can work on their form all day long. They don't believe they can score the touchdown. They don't believe it. And, and you can look in their eyes. They can have all the results in the world. You talk to them. They don't believe they can score the touchdown. They don't believe they're the one that hits the game winning shot. And until you give them results, until you give them the moments of, I actually can do that in an environment where you can mess it. Like we can mess up a hundred times. They can drop the game winning touchdown a hundred times. All they need is the one. And from that one in an environment where failure is not the end all be all from that one, you can spark off some because then failure, you need to start having failure matter. You need to start having specific situations Mm -hmm. matter. But until they get that look in their eye, until they get that stupid idiotic belief in themselves, it doesn't matter. So that's, that is why we use that general aspect of play. That is why we use handball. That is why we use those situations. And from there, we can get super specific. And we do. But I I, I really believe until you get that into their heads, it's it's pretty pointless because you can teach them how to throw the perfect spiral every single time. If they don't believe they can do it at the end of the day, it's it's really not going to matter. Yeah, it's like that. um, Looking at the roots of it, it's it's like it's a it's not just movement. I mean, movement obviously critical but it's also the emotion that ties in the joy and the belief and the confidence like you could put confidence into those roots as well and that's actually what hurt me with i used to love baseball baseball was my favorite sport for years when i was a younger child i used to and i we were just talking about this before we pushed record like i probably told this story before i'm like oh, i'm telling it again here we go but like i used to watch pitchers and i used to emulate them i mimicked them like paul cater i just talked about recently on this show like i didn't i i didn't know what i looked like but i knew what they looked like and i would go out to the wall there was a a church next to our house the big old brick wall you know a grass field and i would just pretend i was that pitcher and throw and and throw baseballs in the wall and you know pretend visualize myself striking out batters and then i actually got uh started playing formally and organized and it was actually coaches who destroyed that confidence in myself. And I, you, I never want to blame, you know, ultimately I think maybe I was, I was just, I was meant for other things and I'm happy with how things turned out. But at the same time, one of my distinctive memories was actually not just with pit, pitching, but also hitting. Like, I remember I finally got like a triple or something. And I remember the coach after I walked back to the uh, dugout, he was like, oh, did you strike out? And I was like, no, I got a triple. And I was like, still, you know, surprised it. But like, there was never any like, nurturing of the confidence from any of those things and that's probably why i ended up doing other things individual sports which is fine i love track to death like <laughs> i track for life but i could always jump high and that was easily like everybody knew it, it you know if, if you jump and touch something high or jump i would go jump up a flight of stairs that's instantly self-evident but there was other things like in the team environment that i do think with like you said my roots were not confident and it even showed in how I ended up playing like basketball. There were certain situations I could do well in if it was connected to what I felt good about, like athleticism or jumping or just practicing shooting, but problem solving that was far from nurtured. So, um, you know, I, I with, with the general and specific, you know, I, I remember this was one of our first, uh, I think it was the presentation you actually did uh, for the bonus material on Elastic Essentials, but it was a lot of like, grappling and stuff that really is like i know and and it reminded me a lot like pre-contact with football because your lineman experience and and obviously i know you have specific experience with that so i'd be curious too like what would it look like and i think i had this question for you basically like 
if you were a football coach, if we everything is wrapped up into one, maybe it's high school football, you're doing it all, you know, or 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 more things. You're what would that potentially look like? You know, as a thought experiment, general play leading into the spe- the specificity of practice. Yeah, well, I, I was actually was when we were, we were talking about the general play. I kind of wrote this out for like what a QB for some reason a quarterback it kind of yeah. clicked in in my head, but it was like it's because you said handball. It's like okay, yeah, <laughs> we can do something with here, but handball okay so handball again we have general play all these games that we're throwing at yeah. them right that's to create the general solver of movement problems just you are capable mm-hmm. to solve movement problems in front of you you are adaptable okay now we want to get one step more specific we're going to play a lot of throwing sports so this is baseball qb guys right mm-hmm. we're going to go more throwing sports so you become a general thrower of the ball one of the best things about handball that i look at is like all the angles they're throwing off of man like one foot sidearm um, step back, mm-hmm. fadeaways on the run, just general throwing of the ball. From there, you can progress to more of a small sided game to where maybe it's like um, a muddle game that we play where yeah. it's like 2v2, you have to throw a ball and you're playing with specific football. Then you can turn that into basically skelly that you do um, in the um, on the football field where it's more technical, tactical. You're running certain mm-hmm. routes, but the general solver of movement problems, general thrower of the ball and then you become a specific position, which is the QB. You become a QB, then you have to understand the technical and tactical aspects. And that's where we can find, and that, again, this is where play drives the prescription. So what mm-hmm. is our quarterback struggling with? Okay, Because that that that's where we, we need to get specific. That's where the needy gritty comes in. But you don't find that out unless you look at the play. And I think a lot of coaches look at the prescription. They need to throw this way. for Well, where are they struggling? Like, Are we actually looking at that? And that's where I really believe in the power of the multitude of environments. So if we were to play football, let's throw them in a skelly environment where they're playing against a bunch of different coverages. Let's say, let's just keep it at coverages, a mm-hmm. bunch of different coverages. What coverages do they struggle in? Do they pick apart a zone really, really well? Do they understand zone defenses? Okay. But when it gets to a man, either maybe they don't trust their wide receiver, or maybe they, uh, they're just not confident in fitting a ball into a tight window. Right? So then the play aspect of, putting them in the play environment of Skelly. So Skelly still play. They're still playing the game. I'm getting data points on what the prescription needs to be. Then I can come back to play of, I understand now he struggles in man, and I'm just going to have him play a bunch of man coverages. So maybe we have a 1v1 round, and we have to get that quarterback super confident in throwing in against man coverages. And, and maybe it's a, this is another thing in like a high school setting. You talk about being a high school coach or something like that, even college. A lot of times you really don't get the pick the people you throw to because it's like you're kind of set with your wide receivers. If you don't trust that guy, okay, and that's your issue, you trust yourself to fit it in, but you don't trust them to catch it, then I'm going to have you run specific games with that wide receiver to build trust and build the competency there. But that's kind of how I would generally go from the yeah. general aspect to the super specific nitty gritty. And then again, I'm going to take them back out to the general aspect to, again, try to get more data points. And that that's really where i find the value in the variety approach with these games is what data points am i getting from that because if i just throw them in the same things over and over again and that's what a lot of football practice is i find out Mm -hmm. the same things over and over again and we're just going to continue to brass our head against the wall but and and conversation is a big piece there too because if you're not talking to your athlete you could think he doesn't trust his ability to fit it in um but really he doesn't trust that wide receiver right so that that was just kind of a way that my brain kind of took that in piece it together but that's how i would work with somebody like a quarterback to become all the way from a general solver of movement problems to a QB. And again, some of that could be physiological too. So it's like, okay, we're not tall enough physiologically to see over the line. So we need to be faster to drop back faster and get over the line and be in that shotgun environment, that type of thing. So you can go all the way to that, or we're not strong enough to survive hits and we're in pain when we play. So now we need to go back to the off season and work on some of those armor aspects. So that's really where I find the power of play driving the prescription rather than just throwing a bunch of prescription drugs at the athletes i love that um i have two thoughts based on what you said one was uh, and back to rock climbing like and and this is where i think rock climbing it it has complexity but it also differs from a purely prescriptive uh training piece is when you warm up for climbing to me at least it's synonymous with exploring maybe you're transversing the wall so you're not going up but you're just going across the wall sideways exploring different holds, kind of getting a sense of your body and the weight of your body, or you warm up on easy climbs. But when you warm up on easy climbs, you don't just do them the same way. It's at least when I do it, I try to find, I'll find an easy climb and I try to climb it three or four different ways each time. Then I find a harder climb and try to find it, climb it three or four different ways. 
And I find week to week, part of my improvement curve is not just, oh, well, you got up to V, you know, whatever, V5 or V6 today. Good job. Like, it's like, well, I also climbed the lower climbs in a lot different ways. And that expanded my library, expanded my roots. My roots are becoming more robust so that when I go to the harder climbs and now the trunk is more involved, where more strength pieces are really needed, isometric strength lock offs, I have a more robust tree. And as you were talking, I was actually thinking about this in light of, you could say, the siloed system that we have. We have the different coaches for the athletes. We have the, the strength coach that is a little bit more, or sometimes much more prescriptive in nature. We have the sport coach that's more, hopefully, more play-oriented, you know, like, and motor learning and alive. A lot of the times that is not the case. But one of the best interactions that I've seen, um, and I wish I had the account. In fact, I will try to make a point to find it and put it in the show notes. But it is a physical preparation coach who warms the team up. And a lot of times that is what the physical preparation coach is doing. But it was a basketball team and it was all with games. It, like it was like it would be like a tag with the basketball, for example. Like we're going to play tag and you have to pass and you have to tag the person with the basketball. All things like that. And it reminded me a little bit of uh, when Rafe Kelly and Charles St. John were on. I, I, I Rafe's been on several times. I met Charles at rafe's return to the source retreat and had great conversations with them and one of the main things i think this was somewhere on episode 302 or something but they had said if we are going to teach a skill and i think this was charles may have been specifically who said this whatever skill i'm working with and charles is a parkour coach he's like i will come up with a game as the warm-up to lead into that ultimate skill and so in some ways, the interaction and the growth of the field are a potential root of growth. If we're talking about the fullness of the tree and creativity and the fullness of training is the physical preparation coach also being in, in a way a motor learning coach if we're talking warmups, understanding and interacting with the coach. Hey, what do we need to get better at? What are you going to be working on in practice? Can I help craft a game that will like that basketball situation I mentioned? And it, like you were talking about, like different aspects of the game. Hey, we more need more speed here. This is where we need to improve. Perhaps a synergy of play in that preparation that could, that just is one way I could see, you know, a potential fit. Obviously, there's so much good stuff like in, in the, the off season and, and people are really moving towards live agility and things that replicate the game and that can be very transferable. I also look at that as a potential step. I just think it's an interesting concept to ponder. Oh, a hundred percent. And that, that they triggered the thought of like, one of the things I don't one one to be able to do what you're talking about, you have to be able to see stimulus as stimulus. And a lot of times yeah. coaches are unable to like pull back and look at play as they are getting sprints in, they are getting agility in, they could be getting jumping in, they could be getting ball handling in. Um, and I think a lot of times if you can't see stimulus as stimulus, you can't just look at that. That's, that's one of the things I love about the handball thing is like taking screenshots and showing the coach they threw the ball in 19 different throwing slots in a five minute game right and you, you all these coaches will like reward people like patrick mahomes for throwing like that and they'll never provide an environment in which they're able to do it and that's that's the thing like as outputs go up as pressure goes up variability inevitably goes down and one of the easiest ways to think about this is parkour mm -hmm. okay you jump over a low hurdle you have 400 different options to jump over a low hurdle yeah. as that hurdle goes up you start to have one option to jump over that hurdle and you're just gonna have like you don't have a choice anymore and as we get to practice and this is what a lot of football coaches do they drive up pressure they drive up output to where the only option that athlete has is to throw the perfect ball in the perfect slot over and over again rather than putting them in environments where variability can be high because pressure is low um, putting them in environments where output is not as high maybe it's against like a lot of times a really good way to do this honestly is put a really good athlete with bad athletes and let mm -hmm. them explore same thing yeah put a high jumper on a low hurdle to explore some things and then gradually progress the level of difficulty that they have to face there so like it, it, that's a lot of times why i think the scout team can be really 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 good for a quarterback a wide receiver because you're getting reps against a lesser but still challenging athlete where you can work on things but but here's the thing most coaches don't let them work on things. So yeah. the output is lower. They could explore here, but your 
you put so much pressure that again, their variability is still going to be the singular solution because they know if they mess up, which you will mess up when you're trying to be creative, when you are doing very, you can mess up a low hurdle by doing a 360, right? You could jump over that hurdle the same way every single time. You already know that the coach already knows that. Um, and, and I really draw this back to my pass rushing abilities is if I messed up my bull rush or my push bull, which are my two moves, I had the fear of being mm-hmm. benched, whether that was right or wrong. It was just such a pressure of like win now situation yeah. on a Monday scout team, bro. Like why? Mm-hmm. Why is there a pressure there for me to perform on a Monday scout team? I should be working rip spins. I should be working spin moves, but I'm going to get bodied sometimes against a lesser athlete. And a lot of times our coaches would look at like, oh, the scout team guy's beating him. You know, like it's that disconnect. So I think the more we can have environments in which variability and it, it's not all the time, but variability can be high. And then you progress your outputs to where, okay, variability is middle, outputs middle. So now you can see what moves are sticking, what moves actually work. And then you can start to trickle in those new moves into a high output environment because yes. they have mastered them and grown comfortable with them in these low environments. Um, I think that's a massive piece to practice. And one of the reasons I emphasize general play and a little bit step back from what I would tip if I had control, um, we don't go super specific because I just feel like the athletes have no no movements or no environment in which they're able to work on these things. So I overemphasize here, whereas if I had full control, we would work on that full spectrum. So when a coach is see like, why are you just playing handball? Why are you not working specific? That that's why, because they never get the option to work on other, all these other aspects, mm-hmm. which I personally think is silly. I think it's coaches getting in the way of themselves because they want to win games, right? Yeah. But the best way to win games is have these adaptable athletes but they get so stressed out. And I've been in these meeting rooms. I was yeah. the division three and division one strength coach. I've been in these football meeting rooms, man. Yeah. They are so stressed out to where if they see a play not work on a Tuesday practice, they're, they, they're like, it's all over. It's not good. It's like, <laughs> yeah. bro, like, let's chill. Like, let's see what the actual thing is here. Not that we're instantly going to lose this game because if you lose the game, you lose your job. So to me, it's, it's one step back can lead to so much, so many better results. It's just allowing ourselves to take one step back but to do that, man, you re- you have to get the head coach to do it. You have to get the the coordinators to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's it's a total different philosophy in how you view movement and how you view practice. Again, practice. It is not the game. Because in the game, you're not trying to work on a new spin move. That's not the time yeah. to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's what we want our athletes to do. We want adaptable athletes. Every coach wants that. And we never give them an environment to kind of work on those skill sets. If you're a coach looking for an awesome training portal to distribute and track workouts for athletes online or in person, then you can get a free 30-day trial of Team Builder software by heading to teambuilder.com and using the code JUSTFLY. See what Team Builder can do for you and sign up for that free trial today using the code JUSTFLY. Yeah. You know, it is interesting to think about, um, like, just looking at the totality of the sport process, like, why... Why are sport coaches so like in a survival mode, right? <laughs> like, it, like if you listen to like, like personal development, like life coaches, psychology, they say it's generally not a good idea to live life in survival mode. Like that's, I think there's like the book Spiral Dynamics and it talks, it has like this like upward spiraling like figure and the bottom is like red. You're in survival mode down here and you want to get to like the nice like integrative colors like turquoise or something as the top. Like you want to be there because you're like integrating all the ideas. But I, I think about it a little bit. I, I almost wonder, like, a, the life of a sport coach, extremely busy, recruiting, pressure of wins and losses. Uh, I was actually just, this was the same, like, Billy Oppenheimer, writer. This was an email, like, three weeks ago that I, I was like, this is amazing. And he was talking about just the need. And this is a little bit off topic, but um, basically, like, like, the need to create the input is the output. And if your whole life is like, oh, we got to win. This has to be right right now. This has, you know, I hope we get these recruits i hope we do this and you never have time to decompress like it was talking about how i think it was johnny cash he would do his best work if he walked in nature the day before you know like you have time to decompress you have time to get inputs that are a little bit more expansive it it does make you wonder i guess you know how coaches end up there but then the impact uh, i remember one of the first dan paff lectures i heard it was like yeah what the coach is like in their emotion the player will then wear, you know, what you are wearing emotionally, that's the, the environment you will therefore kind of create. And so I do, <laughs> it does, it is interesting to think of why that is, but at the same time, and I'd be curious, I'd be curious into literature or people who are doing case studies in the famous well-known coaches and how they got people who are doing a masterful work, you know, and what's their 
what's their background, what's their mentality, those kind of things. Um, but with what you were saying with the, yeah, the, like the play, like how you would set up leading into the main work. I also think of, it's like the tree. It's like, there's an expansion, which is all the play, all the exploration, all the non-pressure, all the like mixing, Hey, you're not going to go against the same person you always do. It's, it's mixing up things. And then there's a compression and there has to be a compression. There has to be the competition. There has to be that point in practice where the pressure's on and there's going to be a consequence. And then there's an expansion again. And so it's always we're working from expansiveness to pressure to it. But then you have to re-expand. And I just think that's the thing that is just so often missed is the expansiveness of, of that thing. And I even think that could even go into physical training. And this is just something I've been focusing on more recently is, and I love complex training. I, you know, I, I'm like, you know, within the scope of the gym, I love mixing different stimuli together. But the one mind trip, and this is just to kind of bring this into also a place of application for people who are not hit, like, hey, I'm not sport, sport coach, so, you know, this isn't my jam. But even like the, like the, the 20 to 40 second edition of like a long sprint or something that's done sustained that mixes, that kind of re-expands the system after doing, hey, I did heavy set of three squats. I did three depth jumps. I did some explosive quick hurdle hops or squats. And then, but then you do something that kind of re-expands. And even like a long, even a long, easy sprint, even like a long 200 meter, 250 meter feel good sprint re-expands the system. And then you go back to the compression. And, and these are just things I think of. And how does this, how might this resonate at different points in physical training, in sports skill? And yeah, I just think the more you understand each node in the whole system, the more each node can kind of fit with some of those principles in nature, I think the the better the total result can be. Well, and, and that, that's something you talked about, like the, the coach is stuck in this survival mode. Yeah. The athlete's stuck in the survival mode. We're bashing our heads trying to play this linear game. And that's why recruiting is so important, mm -hmm. because when you play the linear game, everybody's playing the same exact game over and over again. And the cream of the crop survive. And that's why it's so important to get the cream of the crop. Um, and it's why it's so like most master mm -hmm. coaches are master recruiters. That is, yeah. That's what co people just don't understand. It's like the, the best college coaches in the world, they're master recruiters. It's, it's getting the cream of the crop in because their system, it's not a developmental system. I, mm -hmm. I've seen very, very, very few successful coaches be a developmental system. Mm -hmm. It's a linear system and it works for them because it's just they are better than the next person and they can crush their heads against the linear system. But the developmental system, it's it's this entering the exponential game like that. That is what you need to get to. That is why, like, I I think of play as the psychedelics for the movement world. Like it allows you the chance to have that. Oh, shit. Why have I not been doing it this whole time? I'm a completely different athlete because mm -hmm. of this. And I've had moments like that. It, softball is a great example of it. It's like I grab the bat a different way and hit a ball a different way one time. Mm -hmm. And that one singular swing changed everything for the next years like it'll change mm -hmm. everything for the next years it changed who i was as a hitter because of the exponential game because i was allowing myself to experiment with some of these things and that that is one of the things that i really because it is about winning and i get it's about winning but this is how you win like this is how you win mm -hmm. especially if you're not a big recruiter you need to play that ex exponential game where it is that oh shit moment those oh my goodness what was i doing wrong moments but you don't get those playing the linear game of I'm just trying to hold on to my job. I'm just trying to survive. But again, you have to take one step back to get there. But once you get there, the, the, the results are that that's where you get somebody like a Patrick Mahomes. That's where you mm -hmm. get the Steph Curry's that are doing things that literally other people are incapable. They're incapable of doing them. Like, and the reason they are doing that is because, again, this is this is what you see with the best athletes. Best athletes play at these practices because they are just better than everybody. Like yeah, they, they're yes. not playing the linear game. Everybody else is playing because they don't yeah. have to, because they know the level of competition in front of them is lower. It is that low hurdle. So they can jump over that lower hurdle. They can score on you easy. So they are still playing. They are still playing that exponential game. They're still hitting the 360 over the hurdle yeah. when they're playing. And one of my like really big passions is providing that like right above average athlete that typically would hold on provide them the opportunity to play that exponential game and man some of the stuff you get out of that is is, is pretty insane because then they're playing well they play against these high level competition guys and some of the things that you discover and and again this is why i think it's very important for yourself to, you, to live it as a coach some of the things i have found in playing like softball it's like wow that would have never happened if i was just 
repeating and trying to survive and trying to do the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah, that makes me think of, well, a couple things. It seems like I always say, I've been saying that the whole time. I have two things <laughs> that I have for you based on what you said. Uh, one is the book Finite and Infinite Games by James Kars, where finite games, like there's a finite set of rules, the goal is to win. For in an infinite game, the goal is actually to keep playing the game. And that makes me think about, uh, Stefan Jones has talked about this. Uh, I'm just putting an article together and this has been in my writing. But And Stefan, I- I've, I've loved this saying or idea ever since I first heard it from him is we're almost losing like the natural athlete, that natural talent, because everything is so manufactured. It gets, you get in the system so quickly. And Stefan has talked about these natural elite athletes. They're like built outside the system. You know, it's, it's free play. It's exploration. Maybe it's playing their older brother, you know, or maybe it's, it's or, or that type of thing where their development, their primary development is actually outside the system. And like what you were saying with the system, so much of the system is stuck, you know, for better or worse. Maybe it's a snapshot of society in general and the place just a lot of us are. Is that like in the system, you're just going to get a lot of that red at the bottom. You know, you're not going to get in the system and it's going to be like, at least now, that like this nice interconnect. I mean, some coaches there are, there are bright spots 100%. I think there's that starting to show up. But by and large, especially once you get to a particular level, it is just the system is almost synonymous with some level of survival mode. And I think, yeah, breaking that chain, you know, those bright spots are breaking that, breaking that open, like you said, giving room to explore, to find a new way to hit. And even, but I'd be interested too in your mental process behind that. Because is it really just as simple as, I mean, maybe like, hey, hey, go explore different ways you hit the ball and hold the bat for five. Like, tell me a little bit about that. Because I'm, I'm curious on how you arrived there and that exploratory process well for me personally it comes back to the mimicry that yeah. that's a oh, big yeah, part yeah. of it too I, i'm a huge believer in the power of learning through mimicry and so one of the things i was doing with my swing just person and this is just swing you can take this and apply it oh, to whatever sure. you want to apply it to but it was like i was just trying i was i would watch a video like i'd literally watch a video and then i would go do that swing then i would watch a different video and then i would go try that swing and it was like oh these are pieces of pieces and i had one swing i was like oh my god that mm-hmm. is the swing that i need to mimic that is that that's what works with me Again, if, if you don't provide yourself with the ability to like play around with these things yeah. and then because again, then you go back to the refinement moment. OK, I had that oh shit moment. Now refine it, play with it, get those reps in. That's the daily sacrifice. So I have hit 100 softballs every single day for the past nine months, every single day, 100 softballs minimum and everything. And that's the refinement process. That's the training, the train process. That's and but once you're playing that linear game and you're you're giving yourself the exposure to that you have these exponential like learning moments where mm-hmm. it's like, oh, if I do this, but you, you, you don't get that if you don't get into an environment where you can play around with some of these things and mimic some of these things and work on something different. And a lot of times, and again, I, I've been here so many times where it's like, you're good enough at a six, you're good enough at a seven that you never want to mimic something else. You never want to mess something. Up. And that's the thing, like, Athletes are like, oh, that'll mess up my technique. That'll mess. It's like, bro, your body's not that dumb, bro. Yeah. Like, that's that's another thing. It's not just like you do something and it's like this. So like, they're scared to mimic. They're scared to try. They're scared to do these things because seven is good enough. Seven is good enough to get them to play. Seven is good enough to get them to start. Um, but uh, I was talking to um Ross, uh, Coach Ross yeah. from uh with Bobby White, and he was saying the same thing. It's like that's our goal is not to stay at the seven. Our goal is to get you to that twelve, mm-hmm. and you'll stay at a seven for a long time, but. It's it's this movement environment over and over and over again. You're playing with things. And again, you're going to fail. You're going to mess around. And it's just trying to get to these moments where that exponential game happens faster. And this is the thing. This is the thing that I really, really want to talk about. Sorry, it was taking me a brain a long time to get there. <laughs> that's but, okay. That's the goal of this whole thing. You know? yeah. Slow growth like the tree. It's like tree in the shade. You know, Go, go to yeah, this yeah. spot. And it's drill. So this is why coaches become married to drills. So let's say it's an A skip. Start with an A skip. That A skip for a percentage of kids will be their exponential drill. It will be the thing that lights up their moment. It will be the thing like, oh my God, that clicked. This is it. And what coaches do is they think it was the drill. They think like that drill is the the, the psychedelics for that athlete. That drill is the mushroom, right? That drill is the key. And they, 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 they get lost in the 99% of people that that drill was not the mushroom for. That was not the psychedelic for. It was not their piece for. What I view training as 
try to give them as many different drugs as possible, as many different prescriptions as possible so they can pick theirs. They can yeah. pick the one that yeah. is their exponential one and not being set. It's not the A skip. It's not the B skip. Mm -hmm. It's not my parkour. It's not holding the bat a certain way. It's what was it for the athlete in the same way that alcohol affects people differently. Weed affects people differently. People enjoy one. People enjoy sodas. People don't enjoy sugar. Like all of our bodies are different. We enjoy different things. We different things work with the chemistry of our brain. And I try to throw as much of at our athletes as possible until I find what is their crack? What is that mm. piece that makes them light up and like, oh, this is it for me. And that is the piece that I think we we constrain ourselves in when we get stuck in these systems. It's knees over toes. No, for one percent of the population, that was the key. For ninety nine percent, it's not. Why are we limiting to it's this answer? It's it's not that answer. It's that answer for the certain population of people. I want to provide as many answers and let the the athlete pick the answer that works for them, so that they can have those moments. Because again, it is so rewarding when an athlete has those moments, and that's why it makes sense why at so many coaches swear by wall drills so many coaches swear by a skips because all you need is one if you get one athlete to light up like that and one athlete to really take off you're like it's it's really hard to get not lot to not get lost in the fact that it was the wall drill that did it um and not get lost in kind of the the singular piece of it and i like to throw as much at the athletes as possible and let them pick the thing that works for them that that sorry that that, yeah. that my brain was kind of going off there but that was kind of the thing that i was trying to get to yeah there's an art form to that too. And I, I think we, we talk about the art of coaching and I think there's a lot of arts of coaching, you know, but I think a lot and a lot of, I think a lot of that whole discussion is goes to the art of working around the prescription, but not as much talks about the art of working around the exploration or how to facilitate that journey. And one, I'm a swim coach I've learned so much from. Uh, what she would do was in the off season or the prep period, the athletes would have ownership of, so the prescription of the workload would be constant in the off season. You're going to get this workload in, but they got to pick the strokes they would do in many cases. Like there'd be a lot of cases where that they could explore the stroke they wanted to work more on or do more of. And then once it got more to the in season period, it changed where now the strokes were constant, but they got to pick the prescription this type mm. of workout, this type of sets and reps, this type of sets and reps. I just think that is also part of the art form of working with the exploratory factors and athlete autonomy. And it's something that you learn also based off the group. I just think it's, it's really powerful. Um, I think we can all learn more by working on that and, and getting a feel for how the athlete is going to channel that through. Um, I, I want to get to the, I got a lightning round for you. I don't do a lightning rounds a lot, so I'm, I'm excited to get that. I did have one other thing. I, I, I forget what piece this mentioned, but I just think, and I've told the story, but it bears mentioning, but like high jump in basketball, like basketball itself, especially like a lot of it is more variable, uh, when you're not just, you know, playing it, but even when you're playing, there's variation, it's task based. And then when you get to high jump and track, a lot of jumpers do really well coming off basketball. And then they just do the one thing, high jump, over and over and over and over again. How high can I go today? How high can I go today? There's not as much exploration, task-based part of the brain. You could say salience network with some novelty. And they actually start to lose their spring. And so it's like, I, I think that actually, and I'm just saying that because I just wanted to bring in a physical piece. Like if we're talking about skills, but I also think just from a raw physical perspective, I, um, I, there's one, uh, I, I love watching Frank Frensich his like adult fitness classes because they're just moving. It's all <laughs> the best fun. YouTube videos ever. Oh man, they are the best. I will put those in the shows. They are the best. And there's one thing he did that I always, I always have this in my toolkit. And it's like you know, French contrast, contrast training is awesome. It's a really power invoking method. But I love like if it's like the jump on the tail end of the four or the three other things, the heavy lifts and the explosive plyo. He has a thing where he has a hoop master. He's got a hoop, and then the other person has to dunk a medicine ball or whatever on the hoop. And so, like, I'll stand on a box and, you'll, you know, mess with the hoop, change it. So, it's just like, I think we could also mix prescriptive with exploratory. And there's so many implications with that, that I think is, I, again, there's infinite possibilities. And we're all different parts of nodes of what the athlete is going to be experiencing in their sport journey. But that's just been a fun way that I've mixed it. And I know you, know, you obviously have done so many creative pieces with that as well. But I just wanted to bring that up um, before the lightning round here and so i don't know if we're going to get through all this lightning round <laughs> um but we'll, we'll i think we can do a few uh so uh here we go first question 
is uh, in the past uh, year, what are some coach or coaches uh, who you've learned things from? Like, what are some things that have really stood out for you in the last year that you've learned? And uh, is there anything that people might not expect, like coaches you would pull from that people might not have expected you to pull from? Well, I'm, I might annoy you with my annoying edgy answer uh-huh. here but it like the person that has lit me up the most in the past year has been Nietzsche like reading all of his mm-hmm. books and like the act of becoming and just the way that he approaches life and training and having adversaries but in that note and this isn't a surprising one the person I feel most embodies Nietzsche is Brady we talked about Brady mm-hmm. Dak yeah, before yeah and it's like the the dude like the dude is just it you are living it and mm-hmm. becoming it and I, I just feel like that, that there's such a powerful piece to just showing up and being the person, being the athlete that you say that you are and creating that in the moment, creating that in the training. That's where I really got the like training for the sake of training. He talks about writing for the sake of writing. Mm -hmm. Like it's not to create this book, great big book. His his big thing is like inspiration. Like I don't, he doesn't motivate himself. He doesn't inspire himself. Nietzsche talks about this. It's like, it's just there. I am interested in what I am interested in. And I feel like that's so powerful in the world of coaching. Uh, in the world of athletics, it's like, what is the thing that actually lights you up? And regardless of what that is, go fully pursue that. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of athletes, they, they they have to sit in this motivation and inspiration games because they're playing things and they're doing things that do not light them up, that do not wake them up in the morning. And for me, it was, it was very freeing because I was struggling with softball in the sense of like, why am I spending time doing this when I could be doing all this other like bullshit? I'm like, I'm not interested in that other stuff. And as soon as I fully like just committed to the thing that I was stupidly interested in for no, I don't know what it, what it is. And Nietzsche talks about not knowing what it is, but when you follow that and pursue that, the pathways that open up in life. And I really believe that's super powerful in the world of athletics. So just fully pursuing the thing, regardless of what it is that you're dumbly interested in, because that is how you become one of one. That is how you become the 12 out of 10. That is how you reach that exponential game of something that you weren't before. And I think a lot of athletes and myself included, we're sitting in this like seven out of 10. I'm supposed to be this business owner. I'm supposed to be the gym owner. I was like supposed to be all these. And I'm like, good enough at them. I created a character that was able to do those things, but it's not the next level. It's not the next thing. And I'm not saying softball is the next thing that you're going to leave a legacy with. It's the act of pursuing and going on that hero's journey of something. And I think a lot of times we lose that as coaches and athletes because we're supposed to be something else. Yeah, I love that. Um, so lightning round, I will actually just go to the next question. I'm used to just like, all right, here's my response to that. <laughs> we'll, we'll go right to the next question. Um, dumbest arguments in strength and conditioning right now, maybe a top three or just whatever's on your mind. I mean, all the stuff over, I mean, it's, it's the same yeah. typical stuff. It, it's, it's Olympic lifts versus like <laughs> unilateral lifts versus jumps and all, all these things where it's like, in my answer to almost every single strength conditioning argument is, when you step up to the plate, when you step up to the free throw line, when you do the tip off, when you when you're on the ice, does it matter? Is that what your athletes are thinking about? And if you don't know the answer to that question, put yourself on the ice, put yourself on the free throw line, put yourself on the plate in an actual game and see what you're thinking about. And once you get to those, that's what you need to pursue. Those are the things you need to think about. Because when I'm at the plate, I'm not thinking about, did I Olympic lift enough? Did I front squat enough? I'm thinking, oh, fuck, what's this pitch that's coming towards Mm -hmm. me, right? And how do we answer those problems? How do we answer the doubt that is coming in there? And maybe it is through a front squat later because you're not strong enough. Whatever it is, maybe it is a simple solution on the back end. But we're arguing about things that when you step up to the plate, we're, we're in an alternate reality. And come back to reality. Be in reality for a little bit. Talk your athletes who are in reality for a little bit then answer reality based questions not alternate reality based questions awesome um next question if you were born 200 years ago i was going to say 100 years ago but i'll just make it 200 <laughs> 200 years ago what profession would you be in right now uh like what would i be interested in or what would yeah, i end what, up doing what, what would you do? um, i yeah. come from a family of construction workers so and i like have broad shoulders so i'd definitely be digging holes or like building <laughs> building houses that's what i would be put in Awesome. Yeah, I, I, I actually, I was thinking about the answer to that myself. I was like, I don't even know. I, I would take a little bit of thought. Um, all right, last one of the day here. Um, what's more gratifying? Getting a thousand in that punching game that you see at the arcade or in a bar, or smacking a home run oh, in softball? Silly question. Silly question. Smacking a home run in softball all day. <laughs> the the dopamine hit that I get from that, it, it's unbelievable. You hit one, and you're like, oh, that that is it. And we're dopamine driven driven creatures. And that is the number one thing that gives me my dopamine hit. I'm like, oh, that worked. 
Awesome. I love it. Well, hey, Austin, every time we have a conversation, gives me so many ideas. I love these chats. So thanks for being on the show again, man. I absolutely appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. Thanks for tuning in to another show. Don't forget, if you want to check out Austin and I's training presentation live and in person, you can attend our seminar on June 8th in Cincinnati, and the details are on justflysports.com. I'll see you next week with another great guest.